This is Eredin, and I'm going to slap him with my wood. Let me explain. There is a weapon you can get at two points in the game from the initial duel with Rosa, and again during the Heist in the Hearts of Stone DLC. This is the Wooden Sword, without a doubt the weakest weapon in the game besides the crossbow, and this pile of junk is what we are going to be using for this playthrough. I don't think I really need to explain the rules for this one, other than that we will be on deathmatch difficulty, because the idea of having fun is overrated. Since we can't start with this weapon from a fresh save, I initially decided to equip the weapon from a previous playthrough, and start the game on New Game Plus. This didn't work out exactly as I had planned though, since for some reason the game took it away from me once we got past the intro cutscene, so it was back to the drawing board for me, this time starting the game from a fresh file. And like I mentioned before, we don't have access to our weapons straight away, so we were going to have to do without for the time being. Let's jump right into it. The start of our adventure was definitely interesting to say the least. We don't have a weapon, so dealing with enemies up until Novigrad was going to be a pain. This first set of ghouls for example, our only option was to run away and immediately throw myself into this ravine by accident, resulting in probably my fastest death in any of my playthroughs. Starting over I ran away again, but this time being chased by a wolf the entire time. So while Vesemir had the luxury of riding on horseback, I had to dodge around following him until the cutscene triggered. I took some crowns from this random guy, and got back on trail to the tavern where we spent some time talking to the locals about Yennefer. The locals didn't take this too kindly though, and I ended up getting in a fist fight with them, which of course I didn't do since my fists are not a wooden sword. Luckily though, running away was an option, and we didn't have to fight them. If you haven't gathered already, this will be a continuing trend for the start of the game. The Nulf Guardians sent me on an errand to kill a griffin, which was going to be difficult without a weapon. First stop though, was to admire some herbalist cake, and prepare some bait to lure the griffin out. Once the bait was set, we hid in the bushes and our old man kindly gave me a crossbow, which was pretty worthless for what we were doing. Thankfully, the griffin must have been Welsh, since it couldn't resist the fake sheep we had put in the middle of the field. The plan for this fight was simple, stand at a distance and watch as Vesemir did way more damage than I expected. Not that I'm complaining or anything, it makes my job a hell of a lot easier. The griffin quickly went down, and we could take the head back in exchange for information about Yennefer. Turns out, she was not far away, and we headed back to the tavern to prepare to leave, but as with all things political, it quickly turned to violence. Vesemir stepped in to put a stop to the fight, but unfortunately that backfired when a group of bandits tried to attack us. After a bit of spinning in circles, dodging them, I managed to sit myself in the back of the building, and could wait for Vesemir to clean up the mess. This did take some time though, which gave me plenty of time to get a drink, refresh myself and take a short nap, but even after all that I came back and wasn't even halfway through clearing the bandits, but the strategy was working, and all I had to do was wait. Despite not starting the fight, much like a kid getting bullied in school, I ended up being blamed and kicked out anyway, but that was okay since Yennefer showed up just in time to take us to the Emperor. So after a quick bath and having a razor against our neck, it was time to meet him, which as always, was quite the insufferable experience, but at least we could move on to finding Ciri. Riding into Velen, I ended up skipping straight to Novigrad to collect our shiny new weapon, but we had a few things to do before we could get there. Starting out, we headed to Triss's house and interrupted some thieves as normal, but of course I had to take the peaceful option for the time being, even though I really, really wanted to swing my sword at something finally. But nevertheless, we moved on and stalked some people to find where they lived, and it seemed the cameraman had a few too many drinks and was a bit slow catching up to me. You'd think after doing as many playthroughs as I have, I would know where to find the King of Beggars, but that's not the case, and I have to settle for the way of slowly walking around. After a bit, we did end up finding the King of Beggars and Triss. She had a package to collect and was going to keep us company along the way. Good news for us, since there is a convenient drowner block in the path, which of course, I can't do anything about. Luckily for me though, friendly NPC damage was increased by a lot with the next gen update, so this didn't take too long. Although saying that, I did initially think I got soft locked 
when Triss did the execute animation but didn't kill the drowner, who spent a few moments laying on the floor. Thinking this was a bug, I reloaded and tried again, but it turns out Triss just deals less damage than a delivery driver deals to your packages, so after waiting for a bit for the drowner to wake up again to slowly get chipped down, we made our way through the passage and moved quickly on to the next task of clearing out some rats and killing a few witch hunters. Once again, for hopefully the last time, I wasn't able to do anything, so instead, I just ran away and sat in the corner on top of the ledge for about an hour, letting Triss do her thing. Not exactly the most engaging playthrough so far, but it's unfortunately our only option. After this, we moved on to meet the Dreamer, who would help us learn more about Ciri. She had been hanging out with Dandelion, and he had an inn nearby. And it turns out I was wrong about the Witch Hunters being the last fight we didn't have a weapon, as we had to help Zorton deal with some squatters. So, back we were to being AFK in a corner waiting for shit to happen again. As a reward for keeping out of the way, we were given a list of names to go check out, and this was perfect, since Rosa was exactly how we get the wooden sword. Wasting no time, I took a quick shortcut to get into Rosa's back door to get my hands on my wood. Looting the sword, I headed into her basement and put my new weapon to the test. She went down with ease, not once, but twice, and this is where I ran into a slight problem. You see, the wiki for the game says that the wooden sword can be reacquired by returning to Rosa's villa, and I remember this being true when I first played the game. But for some reason, the devs decided to remove this in a recent update, and the sword was no longer available after completing the quest. I tried a few things in this situation desperately trying to find a way to keep the sword, but nothing seemed to work. I tried using Ard on the weapon rack to move the sword to see if it made it lootable, and I even tried getting the sword but not going into the basement, and instead leaving through the back door and jumping over the wall into Novigrad. My plan here was to take the sword with me and hopefully gain full control again, since in this state, I was locked into a walking speed and unable to interact with anything. From here, I would have had to go and complete part of the Hearts of Stone DLC to be able to get the permanent wooden sword from the heist quest. Despite this though, I was unable to do anything, it even softlocked the game since I had no way to get back into Rosa's house to continue without reloading a save. Now, this is where the rules of this run get a little bit blurry. I remembered there is a vendor in Novigrad that sells a weapon called the Blunt Sword. This has the exact same stats as the Wooden Sword, just with a different name. With no way out of this situation, and for the purposes of this playthrough, I opted into buying the Blunt Sword instead. For the purposes of the script, I will still be referring to it as a Wooden Sword though, purely because it sounds better. With that out of the way, let's continue. Next, I went on to try the sword against some bandits that were harassing one of the women on the list. This actually went much better than I expected. Our sword was doing decent damage for the time being, and honestly, it just felt nice to be able to hit things again. We continued down the list until we eventually had to return to our vertically challenged friend, who wanted to go listen to some music at the Kingfisher Inn. We got almost immediately accused of being a murderer by the very person we protected, Luckily for this whistleblower though, I wasn't bowing, just a witcher, so she got to live. Since Dandelion managed to upset the entire population of Novigrad somehow, it was up to us to bail him out. Not before taking a bath, which ended up getting bloody when Horson's boys broke in to cause some trouble. And in my case, big trouble, since our weapon was taken from us and we were instead given this non-wooden club. So it was yet again time for a break to just sit and do nothing. Just so you know, this playthrough took about 40 hours, and I'm pretty sure at least 10 of those hours were me sitting AFK waiting for things to die of natural causes. The only saving grace of this part is the area behind this door is a safe zone, and the henchman couldn't come through. Once we dealt with the intrusion, Cleaver made it very clear he was pissed, and wanted to take revenge against Junior, insisting we kill him instead of talking to him. A sort of shoot first, ask questions later approach if you will. Dijkstra on the other hand was much more willing to help, but not for free. I had to go investigate his sewers to see how his treasure got stolen, and admittedly, this would be the perfect place to transition into an ad for a VPN, but sadly not today. Following the tunnel was pretty uneventful, aside from a couple of drowners, where it sank in just how little damage I was doing, but more on that later. I returned to Dijkstra with the fragments of the bomb used to break in, and had a little chat. We found the pool used and got some information from Happen. 
it just so happened that the person who apparently came into the bathhouse had long been dead, and somebody was pretending to be him. Dijkstra gave me an address, and I was on my way. A quick breaking and entering charge later, and we discovered Dandelion was of course the one behind the heist. I ate no snitch though, so I conveniently hid that information from Dijkstra and took Triss straight to the Gulag, where she had a lovely time in the next room with a group of guys, while I spoke to Menga getting some information about Dandelion. Playtime was over though, and Menga went to a farm upstairs, but I didn't have time to waste, I needed to get to Junior before Cleaver did. This sequence of events went just about as well as I expected it to, involving lots of Geralt ragdolls and an excessive amount of AI abuse. I cleared the arena one henchman at a time gradually making progress, a hundred swings at a time. And it hit me, weapon durability was going to be a big problem this run, or so I thought. At first, I assumed that I would have to constantly repair my wooden sword during combat to keep my damage from falling off. But it turns out, the durability on this thing does absolutely nothing, so enjoy looking at the red sword icon on the left side of the screen for the rest of the video. Anyway, back on track, I finished up in the arena and moved on to the next location, which would be the casino. And what a piece of shit this was. If having low damage wasn't bad enough, Having to fight all these thugs in an area I can only describe as being tighter than Renan's pussy was absolute hell. After countless failed attempts, I resorted to my favourite strategy of running up and down the stairs baiting them one by one to make things a bit easier. That was until I came up with an even better idea, which was standing behind the bar and watching them line up one by one waiting to be served. With the henchmen defeated, we moved up the stairs into the building, where we freed a prisoner who seemed to have been interrogated probably for being shorter than 6 foot tall. It was no use though, Junior was nowhere to be found. Upon returning to Dijkstra, he happened to know a guy who knew a guy who knew where he would be. With all of the leads exhausted, we went to Vernon Roach, who took us to Radovid. He shared with us where Junior was hiding since he was no longer of use to him, and off I went. This section was unsurprisingly difficult. A swarm of enemies with next to no damage was not a great combination to say the least. I resorted to running in circles around the courtyard, but even that wasn't that effective. I ended up taking more back shots than Mia Khalifa, which was enough to finish me off. Five hours of in-game time passed, and I walked into the room that is far from safe for YouTube, and kicked the shit out of Junior for hurting Siri after he told me what happened to Dudu. He was in witness protection, so we baited him out with a play, which helped us fish him from the crowd. The locals weren't a big fan of this though, and took matters into their own hands. They didn't like something, so they tried to destroy it, kind of true to life in a way. I did have far too many close calls here though, and it honestly would have been embarrassing if I managed to die, but with Dudu secured, we could go ahead with our plan to save Dandelion. That of course, involves cartoonishly dropping a tree on the escort. Not going to lie, now I think about it, this plan could have easily gone horribly wrong, and we could have just straight up murdered our friend. It worked though, so I set out to chase the witch hunter carrying Dandelion and finally had a playthrough where I didn't struggle getting into the hole. I just wish I didn't have that issue in real life as well. The witch hunter inside the hut was incredibly easy to fight, since because it was one on one, I could just parry and attack on repeat. This is actually one of the two advantages we get using the wooden sword instead of fists. Dandelion regaled us of his time with Ciri, and how she nerfed the fuck out of there when she got shot by a crossbow. With that, Novigrad was completed, and I could move on to Velen to follow the lead Amir gave us initially. Unfortunately, this lead wasn't that useful, since the contact Hendry had recently relocated to the afterlife. But thanks to a bit of luck, he left a postcard. His sources showed Ciri had stayed with the Bloody Baron, so I did a bit more travelling and talking to people before ending up in the presence of the guy himself. Random side tangent here, I know it's just the beard, but every time I see this guy I swear he doesn't have a chin and is all just neck. Anyway, back on track, he shared with us a little bit of information he knew about Siri, and I must say it was a nice change of pace to be dealing damage once again, even if only for a brief period. She was taken care of by the Baron, but his family had gone missing, so to get him to talk more, we had to look into that. First step was checking out the rooms. They were a bit damaged and it was clear his wife was attacked, but that was all I was able to find, so it was on to the Pella. Maybe he would know something. It was a little bit inconvenient that the Baronsmen also wanted to talk to him, but they were no match for my flimsy toy sword. With the men finished using my wood, I spoke to the Pella, and just like 90% of people in this game, they weren't going to help for free. 
He misplaced his pet goat, because of course he did, and it was up to me to find it. Some wolves gave me some trouble along the way, but thankfully I didn't die for a change, so that was pretty nice, and I was able to return Princess to the Pella. He revealed that Baron treated his wife like a trading dummy, and that didn't sit right with me, so I went to confront him. He set the place on fire, and the only way to settle this was with my fists. Which, as you might guess, is a bit of a problem, especially since we are locked in the area with the only option being to fight him. I tried losing to him intentionally, which turned out to only be a quick way to speedrun to the loading screen, and I was worried that this was the moment the run would die, to this neckbeard of all things. Next, I tried running away, but the gate was closed, and I didn't really have a plan of what to do until I spotted a very convenient pile of fire. I tested to see if it did damage by throwing myself on top of it to burn a bit, and then baited the Baron into walking over it. He went down faster than an aircraft made by Boeing. The run was still alive, unlike the fetus he buried in the back of his castle. Well, I guess it technically is still alive, but as a lubberkin. I had the option to either kill it or bury it, and given that my damage was lower than the pants of any sorceress that talks to Geralt, I think you can guess which one I chose. So escorting it is. It took a while, but 30 minutes of slapping raves later, I died, which admittedly was quite frustrating, mostly because it was my own impatience getting me killed. The second attempt went much better, using the great strategy of recklessly hitting enemies until they get low, and then being a giant pussy letting my health regen from the use of Gormir, carrying my playthrough just like it did when I did fists only. We buried the Lubberkin, and moved on to following its trail to the Baron's family. This was where I made the first of two fatal errors. One of the main things that was keeping me sane so far was the idea that combat skill points were going to be a great buff to my damage, and I decided this was a great opportunity to test this. I learned that the skills had no impact on my damage at all, which sucked since it meant this was as strong as I was going to get, and we still had a long way to go. Regardless, I kept going and followed the Lubberkin down the road. Thankfully, the only monsters I needed to fight were rot fiends, so I only needed to kill one to clear the whole pack. Once dealt with, I took to examining the horses, and came to the conclusion that the Baron's wife and daughter were attacked. I continued rolling after the Lubberkin, all the way to the random family in the middle of nowhere. All it took was one question to get the information we needed, thanks to a kid not being able to keep his mouth shut. Skipping ahead, his daughter did not want to go back, not surprising given the situation, and upon sharing this with the Baron, he gave us a crumb more about Ciri. The rest would come when I found his wife. To find her though, we had to take a slight detour to look at some tits, and I don't mean birds. We had to find Kira, she could help us, and she was also taking a bath. We had a bit of back and forth before going into the cave Ciri was supposed to go to in order to meet on Elven Surge. The Wild Hunt beat us there though, and we gave chase. Luckily for me, most of the enemies are optional here. These drowners for example, we can just run straight past. The most problematic enemy here was in fact these harmless rats. I had to clear the nest, but this could only be done with bombs or signs, and to do that, I had to make sure for the rules of the challenge that the rats didn't get hit. All it took was a bit of patience though, beating the rats with my wooden sword, and trying to angle my igni to only hit the nest. We moved deeper into the cave and nearly caught up to the wild hunt. Only one thing stood in our way, this golem. If you watched my fists only video, you would know that it was possible to stunlock it just by punching it fast enough. With the wooden sword though, this wasn't possible. Instead, I just let Kira take care of it. With the golem defeated, and a couple portals later, we reached the wild hunt. This room with the hounds of the wild hunt were impossible to deal with using only our sword. We just didn't deal anywhere near enough damage to counter the regen. That's no issue though, since once again this fight is entirely optional, if you know how to skip it. Ignoring the 50 or so resets it took for me to figure out the timing of when to use Yerdon on the portals, it is possible to break the portals before the hounds spawn. I found the best time to place it was when the quest update popped up on the screen, and with the right timing, we barely had enough health left to survive. Now for the part I figured would be the most difficult part of Velen, fighting Nithral. But he wasn't the thing that I was afraid of, he was actually incredibly easy since Kira exists. No, that honour would go to the hounds of the wild hunt that he spawns each phase. Isolating them and taking them out one by one to avoid them healing too quickly was the only option. The first round went exactly to plan, 
until he annoyingly bugged out and froze inside of his ball. The second attempt went really smoothly. The hounds, surprisingly to myself, posed no challenge, and button mashing once again prevailed. After Kira defeated the member of the wild hunt, we searched through the shelves and found out about the ladies of the wood that Siri encountered. She wanted me to stick around for a bit to help her out, but I really couldn't be asked and went into the swamp in search for the crones instead. The old woman in the house got extremely defensive for some reason. I was just an elderly man trying to talk to a group of small children. A bit of cheating in hide and seek let me convince the children to distract Gran while I spoke to the kid that knew something about a kid named Johnny. He lived nearby in the swamp, and I had to use my witch's senses to find him. This is where I made the second fatal error of the run. Curiosity got the better of me, and decided it would be a fun idea to test how much damage my fist did in comparison to my wooden sword. Remember earlier when I said it sank in just how little damage I was doing? Yeah, this is the moment that really made it stick. My sword was doing less damage than my fists. It wasn't worth dwelling on though, the run had to continue. I found Johnny pretty easily, but his voice needed finding still. And this is where I discovered the second benefit of the wooden sword. It still allowed us to perform finishes on downed enemies, which is only really possible against flying enemies, but those tend to be the more annoying ones to deal with anyway. We retrieved his voice from the nest and went to talk to Gran. On the way though, I encountered what I can only explain as a bug. Up until this point, drowners were doing about a quarter of my health per hit. For some reason though, this arsehole over here decided to just delete me from the game. Moving on, Johnny emotionally manipulated the old woman into introducing us to the crones. They tasked us with killing a tree and taking a man's ear, just the usual witcher stuff. There was a werewolf protecting the entrance to the cave holding the heart of the tree, which would be impossible to fight with my damage. Instead though, you can just pop around the back and do an annoying jump around this tree to the platform avoiding triggering the fight. Once in the cave, I could just ignore the Indregas and focus on the tree, since it only took a few hits to destroy. On my way out, the man van Gogh'd himself and we could return to the swamp. Our task was complete, and I finally had the measure of meeting the sexy ladies of the wood. Unfortunately for them, my wood wasn't for them. They honourably kept up their end of the bargain, and shared the tale of how they tried to eat Siri, and how one of them had a pretty obvious foot fetish. We would deal with them another time, for now I had to go and share the good and bad news with the Baron. He initially took issue with the situation, but quickly caved and gave us a rundown of the rest of what he knew about Siri. She fled the area, and it was time for me to do the same, and move on to Skellige. For the first time this playthrough, I was feeling quite optimistic. Skellige is probably the easiest part of the game, since it is mostly cutscenes and walking from point A to B. Not the most interesting for the sake of this challenge, but it's definitely a nice rest point after struggling through the early game. Arriving on the isle, I wasted no time flirting with Yennefer at the funeral and tripping on acid, massacring a room full of stuffed animals followed quickly by a 5 minute break as Yennefer took down the golem, which tried to prevent us from stealing priceless artifacts. After the wake, I foolishly tried to jump over the edge into the water below, not once, not twice, but three times hitting rocks each time before with a bit of a run up, landed it on the fourth attempt. I'm pretty sure this didn't even save any time getting to the forest to help Yennefer. She planned to use the mask to find traces of Ciri and see what went down. Normally, you have to fight foglets here, which starting out I did, or at least I let Yennefer fight them. That was until I discovered you can skip that entirely by using the mask in combat and running ahead. At the end of the forest, we found a dead body. It was a rider of the Wild Hunt. With evidence of the Wild Hunt attacking Skellige, we went and pestered the locals about what they knew. Their info led us into a garden looking for another dead body of a man named Craven. Normally, I thought you had to fight the wolves here, but apparently if you run fast enough, you can just ignore them. Underneath the tree we found his body kind of like that one Logan Paul video, but instead of making fun of the poor guy, we brought him back to life for a bit. He gave us a nice flashback of Ciri and how she sailed away with an elven sage on a boat. When he woke up on the beach, he saw a creature and you may not like it, but this is what the peak male body looks like. He could be the key to finding Ciri, and it just so happened I knew where he would be, Crow's Perch. This absolute hunk of a man got on the back of our horse and headed to Kaer Morhen in hopes to cure his curse. Unfortunately for me, everybody's favourite man-child intercepted us on the road, so I had to deal with that first. Uma dropped some sick moves on Amir before we left to get back to what we were doing. 
When we made it back to Kermorn, Yennefer gave us some household chores to run, so off I went to kill a forktail and spent half an hour slapping drowners with Lambert. With that done, it was time to slap Uma with some chemotherapy, and the elf that came out the other end gave us Navi from Zelda to lead us to Siri. Here, I accidentally broke the game, and sailed the boat straight through the trigger to go to the Isle of Mists. Upon reloading the game though, it fixed and actually worked this time. Following the wisp led us to a hut that held Siri, but in typical Witcher fashion, the dwarves occupying the area refused us entry until I helped them out, which meant it was time for that part of the game again. This fucking escort quest. I knew it would be bad going into it, but I didn't expect to get as angry and tilted as I did. These gremlins filled me with so much rage with them spending most of the time invisible. I tried to get out of their range to let my health regen a bit, but it didn't really work until I found out that I can just jump off this cliff and hide for a bit. It wasn't the most glamorous solution, and my language may have been extremely blue for the entire duration of this mess, but I got the job done and eventually returned him to his friends. Siri rose from the dead, and because I just wanted to get this island behind me, I skipped all the dialogue and teleported back to Kaer Morhen, where we prepared to face the wild hunt. The warriors and their hounds breached our fort. It turned out to be another easy fight, Instead of having to kill things myself, I had four NPCs at my disposal to do most of the work for me. I did try using these tiny fire patches to deal damage, but they didn't do anything. It wasn't long before we were overwhelmed, there were just too many of them. Vesemir got a free chiropractor appointment, which he desperately needed after carrying me on his back for the entirety of White Orchard, and Siri performed some opera for us. The funeral was quite the sombre occasion, apparently Lambert also died this time around. I didn't even know this was possible. Siri took the death of her loved ones not well at all, so in an attempt to make her happy, we played around in some white powder, but as much as I'd like to keep doing this, it had been a long day and sleep was needed. Siri woke us up in the middle of the night to go fuck some shit up. I'm not one to say no, so I reluctantly followed her and made our way to the Bald Mountain. The locals greeted us like a neighbourhood in Detroit, sticking a weapon in our face and assuming we were the enemy. We made our way past the nut job, and we ended up letting Siri practice her sword skills on Fugus, and climbed up the mountain to face off against Imlarith. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I originally aimed to get this video out before Christmas, and if you're watching this video as it's coming out, you're probably aware that it's currently June, which I guess is technically still before Christmas, but six months later than I had wished. And this guy is pretty much the sole reason for that. Starting out with phase one, it was pretty easy, but that wasn't the problem. I had to wait to get in each bit of damage, and his health bar was moving so slowly I was almost convinced that it wasn't me damaging him, and he was instead just dying of old age. In fact, at one point I got so desperate I tried to climb on top of the bonfire over here, just hoping it would deal damage when he walked into it. Instead, all it did was burn me, and Imlarif was smart enough to just watch my dumbass doing this to no avail. We had to do things the slow and boring way, and that was the issue. This fight was taking about an hour each attempt just to get out of phase 1, which was the easy part. The hard part was unironically I kept almost falling asleep. Once we did get to phase 2 though, our chances to deal damage fell off harder than the typical clout goblin on TikTok. His attacks became much more difficult to dodge and I died a lot. This was why this run took so long to get out. This one guy. I tried across two days to beat him at first but eventually the idea of spending two hours each attempt got to me, and I had to take a break for five months. Every time I got the idea to complete it, this fight and the time it would take kept tormenting me. When I did eventually get the motivation again to come back and finish what I started, it went extremely well. I figured out that you can manipulate the attacks that he does in phase one, so he will always do the same attack over and over again without teleporting. This meant that not only was it extremely safe, we could do much more damage and get to phase 2 faster. Still a long time and infinitely more mind numbing, but it worked. Hit him after he tries to hit us, dash back, wait for him to walk to us, let him attack, dodge, and repeat this over and over on loop for about 30 minutes. Next up was phase 2. I figured out he will always teleport 3 times, and on the first 2 teleports he will always swing up to 3 times. The animations are somewhat easy to tell apart if you know what you're looking out for making the fight somewhat easy. I made a few mistakes in phase 2, getting close to death a couple of times, but on my second attempt after my long break, he went down and I could finally move past this pretty bad mental block I had. 
With Imlerf defeated, me and Siri returned to Novigrad to meet up with the crew. I decided to do final preparations in the order I believed would be easiest to hardest. Avalak wanted to go through some portals to gaslight one of the members of the Wild Hunt, into turning against Iridan. The path there was easy, just kill a few sand crabs and we could move on to the next zone. From here, it turned into a walking simulator quite like the journey my parents took to get to school. After taking several portals, we ended up reaching the elf, and took yet another portal to get back to Novigrad. He was to dream what happened, since as we all know, everything that happens in a dream happened for real. It was revealed that the king killed himself with two gunshot wounds to the back of the head, with a guy who looks quite a bit like Jared Leto from Timu in the same room. Crazy how that happens. Next up was Ciri's tour of Novigrad. Junior was apparently still alive, despite my wooden sword being pretty deep inside of him last time we met. As we approached the entrance to his place, he got the last laugh and crashed my game as I went to talk to the guards at the entrance. Loading back in, Siri gave them a ton of sass. I spaced out and died, but after loading in again, gave them a beating until they let us in, as apparently he was expecting us to show up. Weird given how our last encounter ended, but we moved inside and it was just Dudu committing a bit of identity theft, even if it was a questionable choice of person to target. We then moved on to the next part of her adventure, which ended up being a bit tricky and hella janky. We approached a troop that previously helped Siri out. They needed horses, but the owner refused to sell to them, resulting in me needing to steal them. This was the tricky part. There was a guard inside that was living up to the name and guarding the horses. Unfortunately for me, I couldn't pull out my weapon here and the guard remained in the way. I needed to get the keys off of his desk to open the door, but I can't interact with things while in combat. The solution? abusing the AI harder than the people pretending to be artists on Twitter. Baiting the guard to the other end of the stable and quickly running back to the desk results in the guard chilling in the middle for just long enough to not be considered in combat anymore, allowing us to loot the keys. I had to repeat the same step a couple more times to drop aggro to open the door and then again to cast Axie on the horses to calm them down. This worked wonders and the run was still alive. Following on from our shenanigans, I moved on to Yennefer, she was attempting to break some witches out of prison, which sounded easy enough. We enlisted a bit of help from our good friend, who is ineligible to go on any of the rides at a theme park, but who needs roller coasters when you can just get pissed instead. It was time to break into the prison. Jumping down the well led us to some elven ruins where my wood stood no chance against this grave hag's tongue. Repeating this section again, but this time killing the hag in advance worked wonders. I found the lever and moved on through the area getting closer to the prison but it wasn't going to be smooth. The area leads you through a narrow sewer system, which just so happened to be filled with ghouls. They heal when they get low, and I thought I was fucked. I would need to defeat them first, to be able to jump up the ledge to the entrance of the prison. I kind of botched this first attempt at fighting them, and ended up getting way lower on health than I was comfortable being. But this mistake turned out to be the best thing that could happen to me. Since I have gourmet, I decided to just sit to the side for a few minutes to let my life recover. But when I ran back into the sewer again to take on the ghouls, it turned out I had waited so long that they somewhat despawned and I could just run past into the prison. Once inside, the witch hunters proved to be no challenge at all. I got the keys, opened the cell, and Yennefer left me alone to finish off the final sorceress with my wood, quite literally leaving her breathless. All that remained for final preparations was to help Triss. Philippa needed to be found, and she just so happened to have turned into an owl. The same owl that Zoltan won, then lost again. Triss used a bit of water bending that was just about as impressive as the live action Avatar water bending, but it did reveal Philippa was inside of Dijkstra's bathhouse, so I guess I can't complain too much about it. We raced through the city and tried to calm the enraged sorceress down, which didn't go too well since she summoned a great big fire golem to rock my shit. I was originally a bit worried about this fight, the golem has a fiery aura that deals burning damage around it, meaning every time I get a hit on it, I take a lot of damage. Good thing I came up with some more dumb cheese to get through this. Baiting the golem onto the stairs, then running away results in it getting stuck, giving me plenty of time to let my health recover and stare into Geralt's wonderful eyes. I repeated this for a while thinking this was the best I could do, until I eventually discovered even more disgusting levels of cheese, levels so high I can't even explain how I think it works. I found out that standing on top of the broken staircase in the arena was actually the perfect place to fight the golem, instead of getting it stuck there. As it turns out, it seems that if I just keep rolling back, hitting it and then rolling back again, you don't take any burning damage. 
With this, I was able to quickly take it down and pin Philippa to the ground. With the squad assembled and Dijkstra getting his routine leg rearrangement, we could set sail to the Skelliger Isles in search of the Sunstone. Ermion knew about it, so I set out to talk to him first. He was in the middle of a meeting that got a bit heated to say the least. The ruler of Skelliger decided to be a moron and start a war with Nilfgaard by killing those in the meeting room. Of course, I got caught up in this. Some running in circles later and I was able to talk to Ermion. He shared what he knew, and I was on my way. Now you would have thought that my experimentation of hitting the ground with terminal velocity earlier would have been conclusive, but apparently not since I decided to do it again here before giving up and just shamefully walking instead to make our way to the bard that which Ermion mentioned. He was lots of help and actually told us where the elven ruins that held the sunstone were instead of asking for something like everyone else. With our newfound information, I went back to Yennefer to share, but Avalak was being extremely shady as if he was hiding something. Acting on this, we went to his lab and gave the place some renovations. With that side tangent dealt with, I quickly got back on track and sailed to where Philippa was waiting at the Elven Ruins. Inside were some drowners protecting a siren blocking our way. I made sure to hastily execute the siren, then watch as Philippa dealt with the drowners, before she bugged out and triggered the cutscene to fix the stairs, but instead of fixing the stairs, decided to go back to killing drowners for some reason. I guess she must have had some pent up anger still from Deekstra earlier. After she had vented her frustration, we moved deeper into the ruins, and found a room that clearly held the sunstone. A light source and three mirrors that when aligned would reveal the sunstone. Normally, you would have to fight the ghosts here, but with a bit of difficult and tedious parkour, you could just skip the fighting and activate the mirrors. Philippa handed us the sunstone and I made my way out of the cave. This was actually the first time I exited the ruins in what I assume is the intended way. Normally I just retrace my steps and go back to the entrance, and use the fast travel waypoint to quickly get back to Avalok. Instead, I ended up in the middle of nowhere, and we had to manually travel back. It did give me plenty of time on the other hand though to relax and appreciate the chill ambient music of Skelliger. The calm before the storm so to speak. We grouped up with Avalok and summoned the wild hunt for one final battle. First up was Karen Thea, who we had the privilege of fighting a good chunk as Ciri first, which was nice since verbal abuse would have probably dealt more damage than this wooden sword. To make up for our piss poor damage, his attacks were at least extremely easy to dodge with some well timed rolls. This fight was going as smooth as butter until he started spawning ice elementals all the time. These were quick enough to take care of by letting him destroy them himself. The problem came when I got deep into the fight and caused a bug that slowly lowered my FPS over time, and played a really horrible noise. Take a listen for yourself. And this was after I reduced the volume for the sake of you guys not suffering permanent hearing loss. The bad news is I had to restart the fight that I was about halfway through. The good news was I think I figured out what caused the bug. If he is spawning a golem at the edge of the arena near the ship, Make sure to stand in a way that faces him towards the centre. If you do what I accidentally did one time and face him towards the ship, the golem spawning from the portal won't be able to go anywhere and just get stuck in place instead causing that abomination. On my second attempt I made sure to always face him towards the middle, even if it meant I had to sit around waiting for a while. This worked well, and as usual when he got to about a quarter health, he stood there and let me hit him with my wood until he died 14 damage at a time. At the end of the fight, I teleported deep underwater and swam to the surface ready to fight Iridin. Crack decided to commit suicide by a wild hunt, and the scene was set for the final battle. My children's toy vest is his well-crafted weapon and armour. His first phase was fairly simple. He would teleport around and recklessly swing his sword at me, which I effortlessly countered by moving slightly to the side. My damage was expectedly low, but I was extremely appreciative that his damage was equally unimpressive. Repeating the dodge to the side and hit strat was enough to get me through phase 1. Phase 2 took inspiration from the viral videos of Luigi winning by doing absolutely nothing. I chilled, pun intended, in the middle of the arena and waited for him to start doing his attack that causes meteors and explosions. Then I would run into him and let that do the damage. It did far more damage than I could even dream of dealing myself. Once his health bar was empty, we moved on to phase 3 as he fled back to his ship. I followed him back through his portal, and we prepared to finish the job. This was essentially just phase 1 part 2, so it was a piece of cake. I finished him off, and met back up with Yennefer, but it wasn't over yet. 
Avalak had betrayed us and had taken Ciri for himself to the top of the mountain. In fact, Yennefer was focused on saving Ciri, she seemed completely unfazed by temporarily becoming the Human Torch. The hands of the Wild Hunt on this final climb were the last hurdle between me and finishing the game. I thought this could be problematic, but where there is a problem, there is a solution. You can just ignore the hounds entirely and run ahead to trigger the cutscene. We spoke to Ciri and Avalak and let her do her thing. She headed into the portal to put an end to white supremacy, and with that, I beat The Witcher 3 using only the wooden sword. Asterisk. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to do the YouTube things like, dislike, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. If you have a challenge you want to see me tackle next, let me know in the comments below. It doesn't even have to be witch related. Take care, and as a hint for the next video, join me next time where I will be exploding all over the wild hunt.